Thank you, Eugene, for that kind introduction. Um, so I was told that I have uh, 18, 20 minutes, so I'm going to go very fast. Uh, bear with me. If you have any questions, comments, please contact me afterward. <clears throat> so the title of my talk is Training the Next Greatest Generation. So let's start with some introduction. Who do I mean by the greatest generation? A few years ago, mm, you'd be so lucky. <laughs> a few years ago, Tom Brokaw wrote a book in which he proposed that the greatest generation was the one that grew up during the Depression and then went on to fight in World War II and then came back after the war to build the huge economic engine that we know today. He called them the greatest generation. Okay, so who's the next greatest generation? You would say, you guys. I say, well, let's just hold off on that definition for now. <laughs> we'll talk about it at the end of the talk, okay? Training. What's there to talk about? We have thousands of years history of education. Don't we know everything there is to know about training the next generation? So why am I here? What can, what can I possibly have to talk to you about? So yes, it's true. We've had classical education, you know, the kind that most of you are doing right now. Go to class, listen to the teacher, read a book, do homework, write paper, take tests. Lot of rinse and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, right? Actually, this classical education served me extremely well. I love it. I love the structure. I love to know that after I take algebra, I will take geometry, then trig, then pre-calculus, and then calculus. I love the predictability of going to class, reading books, taking tests. And most of all, I really, really, really love the idea that I know exactly how much I'm learning. Right? I take a test, I get an A, I learned a lot. I got an F, not so much. Okay. So that's all good. I just say the classical education served me very well and it's done a really good job. So what's the problem? Here's the problem. The problem is with modern education, it's a really complex process. It's very broad. You have so many subjects you must learn. It is so deep. You have to learn so much in each subject and it is crazy fast. You have to learn because ideas, things change, evolve constantly. So this is the era of the Higginbotham miracle of genetic marvels of fantastic new material like graphene. So the three R's that we know is no longer enough. You know, I got to this point toward the end of my undergraduate career. And I went on, on a quest ever since then to come up with a new way to learn, a new way of looking at education. And I came up with something called pie learning. It's a new approach to higher education. Okay, so who is like pie? Who is like chocolate pie? <laughs> who wouldn't love chocolate pie? So let's start with the top. That is the creamy, fluffy cream. Those are the subjects that I choose to learn because I love those subjects. For me, they were Victorian literature, swimming, and languages, not necessarily in that order. So the middle part, the chocolate, the meaty part. So that was the part that I learned that I needed to learn to become an engineer, a researcher, and a designer. So I take classes like stochastic processing, information theory, and I love those classes. And then finally, what's in the bottom? The crust, the pie crust, okay? I want, yes, a plate. No, I wasn't learning how to make a plate. Just the pie crust. And what I wanted to have is the opportunity to put everything that I learned into a context. And I got that with my PhD, and I loved it, okay? It turned out that this is not a new idea. You guys already start doing this, right? What is this picture? 
science fair, right? Many of you participate in science fair already. So that's a, what we call project-based learning, and I call it learning by doing. Some people call it experiential learning, whatever you want to call it. And I think that science fair is a great introduction for you guys to this idea. But here's two problems with science fair. Number one is you do it once a year and that's it, you're done. And number two is whatever you might choose to do in the science fair does not correspond to what you learn in the classroom, okay? So I wrote my PhD thesis, turned it in, got my PhD lollipop, and that was the end. I finally got to the end of my education of education process. I was graduating, I was going back to the real world. I'm not gonna deal with any of this stuff again, so I got my freshly minted PhD and walked out the door and went to Silicon Valley. But of course, that's not the end. A few years later, I ended up teaching at Stanford. And I started teaching traditional classical classes, the kind of classes that I took as an undergraduate. And I loved it, it was great. And one day I went to a party at a friend of mine. Her name is Andrea Goldsmith, and she happens to be a professor in the electrical engineering department as well. And we started talking. And I said, you know, Stanford just started out this new freshman and sophomore seminar. It sounds really cool. You want to teach with me? And she said, sure, I always want to teach freshmen, and I've always wanted to teach with you. So together, we form a team, and we call our class EE15N Freshman Seminar, The Art and Science of Engineering Design. And that was eight years ago. So this is the full time we taught the class. We finished this class just this past March. The premise of the class is quite simple. We take a bunch of freshmen who know nothing about engineering, nothing about design. We say, good, come on in. Form teams, choose a project in any way that you can justify as an engineering project and we will help you do the project, okay? So that sounds really great. But at this point, you all should be start asking, well, what can they do? Give me an example. Here is what a freshman team can do. This project is called the Project Charge Cycle, and there are four fabulous young men in the team. And from left to right is Aaron, Jeff, Jamie, and Chuck. Okay, so they have eight weeks from the time they figure out what they want to do. They have eight weeks to do this. So let me describe to you what they did. First, they decided they want to somehow use the energy generated when you pedal a bicycle to charge batteries. Great, they came up with the idea. Then they went to visit the, the bike graveyard next to the Caltrain station down University Avenue. They went and talked to the guys who uh, work in the Stanford bike shop. They sweet talked them to giving them parts. And between the parts they got from the bike graveyard and the bike shop, they built this Frankenstein of a bicycle. Then they went and convinced their dorm maid to help them with the electronic design. So they designed the electronic, they built it, they tested it, and it works. So bear in mind, you took four freshmen with very little engineering design experience. They built this, test it, get it to work, while in class, in many other classes as well, because they're freshmen, right? So, the student who takes this class absolutely love it. They love it. They, many of them go on to choose career in engineering and design because of this class. Why do you think it means so much to them? They get to do something real. They get to translate the knowledge they learn in the classroom to a project that they care about. That's, that is the killer app. That's what makes a difference. So here's the problem. Just to work on a project like this wasn't enough for these very smart, very driven, very thoughtful individual. So sometime toward the end of each class that Andrea and I teach, some of the students will come up to me and say, I have an existential question for you. And I thought it was the hardest question. So what question did they ask me? Here's what they asked me. What about real world projects? You know, it's very nice to come up with cute little ideas to test out. But what about all the project problems, all the challenges in the world? Why don't we get to work on those? 
Those are complex, open-ended problems that require real solution. What about those? I didn't have an answer for that. Okay? So this is the third part, the second part of my education, about education. I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I talked to lots and lots of people. I've now talked to about 200 people about this problem. And then I decided, okay, we are going to try something new. I'm going to try something new. What did I do? I go and I start a new class called Engineering for Good, EE46. I start that class in winter 2010. I caught my field of dream. Anybody of you have seen the movie Field Dream? Okay. If we build it, will they come? If I start this class, will the students show up or are they just talking? Well, they did come. Here's the premise of E46. I take projects, real projects from NGOs and not-for-profit company. I bring the student into the class. The student go all the way from freshman to graduating senior. They are majoring from international relations, political science, sociology, to chemistry, to product design, to civil engineering, to electrical engineering, to computer science. I take them all in and I say, form a team, pick a project that you care about, and get working. Okay, at this point, you should also start asking yourself, what on earth were they doing? So let me give you an example of what they did. Project Data Go worked with a small NGO called Altona Foundation. They work with people in remote villages in Guatemala. They build with the communities, build up these tiny Pico hydroelectric plant to generate enough electricity to satisfy their modest needs in this community. So, in eight weeks, this is what they did. They designed, actually they didn't even know how to use the CAD tool, so they learned how to use the CAD tool. They designed, they sent it out, have it built, brought it back and tested all of this in eight weeks. Okay, cost me $750, that box. They did it, they did it all by themselves, three guys. The device has been installed on site by the NGO since April of 2012. So in eight weeks, they did all this that would normally take people six months a year with lots and lots more resources than they do. Okay, so every time I teach this class, I taught it twice, and the response was just overwhelming. The, the student absolutely, absolutely adored it. They learned so much from it. They get to do something they love, translating something that people need, and doing so by combining what they learn in the classroom to the problem in the real world. They absolutely love it, okay? But that still wasn't enough. What was wrong with this model? This model means you take the class for a quarter, you work on the project, and then at the end, it's over. You don't get to go and bring it out to the field to test it out to make sure that it's working. You don't get a chance to improve on the design, okay? So that led me to my third stage. I created a program called Stanford Gap for Good last summer with the support from the Stanford Institute for Innovation of Developing Economies, we uh, selected eight students to work on four projects for the whole summer. And the end of the summer, three of them actually went out to the field. This is the Cambodian team, Katie and Brian. So what did they do? What did they do last summer? They worked on a project called Easy Peasy. And Easy Peasy, although it has a very stupid definition here, what they aim to do is absolutely remarkable. So these students, these two students in one summer, figure out the following thing. They figure out that they can use a chemical, a very simple, popular chemical, to neutralize, to remove bacteria from human waste, and use that human waste to become fertilizer. The chemical they chose was lime. They went to Cambodia, they worked with the farmers to figure out how they can create these latrines how they can use lime into the human, put lime in the human waste. They figure out the supply chain. In this country, if you want to buy lime, a bag of lime, you go to Home Depot, end of story. In Cambodia, in remote villages of Cambodia, it's so much more complicated than that. They figure out the supply chain, how to get lime to these people, okay? They figure out a way to test, to determine that their solution was working. They then give a presentation to the NGO in Cambodia. I don't have to tell you, they knocked the socks off the partners. The partners absolutely loved it. 
and the ball has been rolling on this project ever since, since last summer. Okay. So, I've now moved the model from learning about taking real, open-ended complex problem, require real results from the student, send him out to the field to test out the idea to do improvement. Okay? At this point, you should ask yourself, well, yeah, they do a lot, but did they love it? Did they really, really love it? So at the end of each class at Stanford, you are asked anonymously to come online and review the class. I would show you one of the quotes. I cut it verbatimly. I did not change a word. Let me assure you, there were 16 comments, and they were all like this. In fact, some of them were even better. I would just like you to read it and let it sink in to you what this class, what this program means to the student. Okay? I cry every time I read these comments. I still do. It means a lot to me as an educator, as a teacher. So, I finally learned how to make a pie crust. I finally got it. My recipe is this. You take real world, open any complex problem, you give it to students, and you demand real results from them. That's my secret. So at this point, you're probably saying to yourself, oh, so what you're proposing is using this training model on us, the next greatest generation, right? And I say, oh, not so fast. Here are a few things we need to talk about. Number one, this is not a new model. I already showed you that this has been done before. It has not been done so often and not an intrinsic part of your education. Not yet. Second thing, I don't know who the next greatest generation is. In fact, that is one of the joys I have when I go around in my everyday life or in my travel. When I look at my student, Nathan, who's my main man I go to on campus for any hardware issue, sometimes I look at him and I say, are you part of the next greatest generation? I went traveling in Istanbul. I met with a group of beautiful young women, and they were trying to practice English, their English on me. And I look at them and I say, are you part of the next greatest generation? I went to Vietnam, and I saw a little boy sitting on a sidewalk, so intent on doing his homework, he literally forgot that there are thousands of people all around him in this bustling market. I look at him and I wonder, is he part of the next greatest generation? I don't know. I don't know where the next greatest generation is, but that is the fun, to go figure it out, to go find these people, to go help train them and support them. Why is that important? What's well, important because the problem we're facing are absolutely enormous. Many people, myself included, believe that the reason the greatest generation was so is because of the challenges they were given. They were given the Depression, World War II, total bombers, okay? And they rose up to the occasion. They did the great things. Well, think of the problems that we have in the world today. We have an economy, a brand new economy that people are still struggling to figure out how does it actually work. We have billions of people with aspirations for freedom, for democracy, and for a better life. And we don't know how to give them or how to provide them those things. And on top of that, we have a climate that's changing in a way that we cannot possibly imagine, okay? It is my fault, it is my generation's fault to give you this horrendous problem. So we want to make sure that you get the right tool to solve the problem. And so you need training, and that's how we're going to give it to you, okay? I also want to contend to you that the next greatest generation is going to come from around the world. Okay, from India, from South Africa, from Brazil, and you're going to be part of that. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention. Thank you very, very Thank you. Much.